I am declaring war against the drug. Sa barangay Santo Cristo naman, dito on the spot din. Huwag mo lang alin mo siya po. Yan ang nakasulat sa placard na ito. The family have been holding vigil, trying to raise enough money to have him buried. This is part of the new war on drugs in the Philippines. Viewed from the streets or through the lens of a news camera, what President Duterte calls his war on drugs is a big news story presenting serious logistical difficulties, but also opportunities for frontline journalism on the human consequences. And it's a difficult story to interpret in that it features a population that seems to be living in fear. According to the polling data, most Filipinos, at least in theory, support the so-called war on drugs, but they oppose the unaccountable killings. As for the president, he's called out his own police force for corruption, but is himself facing serious allegations of wrongdoing. One of the leading Filipino news outlets on this story is Rappler. It's an online platform that also advocates for journalism as a potential source of solutions to the country's social problems. Rappler's editor-at-large, Marites Vitug, has also worked for foreign news outlets such as the New York Times. Her investigative journalism has won awards and led to threats against her. I spoke with Ms. Vitug about the challenges of reporting on the so-called war on drugs under a president whose contempt for journalists resonates with what we're seeing in other parts of the world where the populist right finds itself in the ascendancy. Marites Vitug, editor-at-large at Rappler, thanks for joining us here at The Listening Post today. Rappler often criticizes President Duterte's so-called war on drugs. Yours is not the only news organization to do so. There's also been plenty of criticism from overseas, yet the polls seem to indicate that the president's policies remain popular with Filipinos. How would you explain that? You know, there is a dissonance in the recent surveys. While surveys show that Duterte enjoys, uh, you know, certain amount or high popularity, uh, the Filipinos who responded to the polls say two things. One... They want the drug suspects taken alive, majority of them. Number two, majority of the respondents fear that they may be the next victims of the war on drugs. So there's a dissonance in the surveys. Now, reporters are taught in Journalism 101 to follow the money. Our piece referred to that Amnesty International report that referred to what it called an informal economy of death, stories of police officers being paid per body, per encounter, is the euphemism that they use, uh, the money that is changing hands between the police, funeral homes, and other organizations. How big is the economic angle in the overall story of President Duterte's so-called war on drugs in the Philippines? You know, I believe that this economic angle, that the police getting paid for kills, is the oil that greases this killing machine. Yes. The media should continue looking at this angle of uh, money for, for killings. But the challenge really for the media is to look for new ways of presenting this same story. It has to look at angles that have not been touched on before. What has been not really reported on is the state of the institution today, the state of the police force. Duterte has called them rotten to the core, that 40% are corrupt. What is their state now? Are they demoralized? Do they still want to pursue the war on drugs? What real reforms are taking place? Two weeks ago, President Duterte quoted Donald Trump directly, saying, urging the public not to believe the media. Are Donald Trump and President Duterte roughly on the same page when it comes to their approach with the news media, and if Duterte is out to discredit journalism in the Philippines, to what extent do you believe that he has succeeded? There is some similarity between him and Trump. Now, what Duterte is trying to do in the Philippines is to trump the media, to use that word, is to discredit us and to make us less legitimate in the eyes of the public, because many in the mainstream media tend to be critical of his war on drugs, and not just that, his other statements and, and policies. And instead, he wants his supporters in the social media to have a stronger voice, to really give more space and, and voice to the pro Duterte social media bloggers uh, who are quite popular in the Philippines. 
But I don't think Duterte will succeed in really discrediting the mainstream media because there is also a long track record of credibility of major media outlets. So it's not that easy to, to trump us. The media in the Philippines, like the media in the United States, are both in a post-electoral phase. In the U.S., many news outlets have been forced, after the election of Donald Trump, to do a little bit of soul-searching regarding their coverage throughout the primaries. In the Philippines, what role did the media play in President Duterte's rise to power, and has there been any soul-searching occurring within the media there? Looking back, I think the fault of the Philippine media was that we did not take Duterte seriously. We only took him seriously maybe in the last month or the last two weeks of the campaign. So that was our fault. We did not do enough research on him. We did not dig deep enough. We wrote about the killings in Davao, but not uh, thoroughly. We didn't really do... a an extensive and intensive profile of this man, this mayor of the city from, from the south. We only were awakened, we were, you know, jolted by the survey showing him leading in the last two weeks. So that was our fault. We did not take him seriously. Reporters are having difficulty, actually, in conducting real press conference with our president, a real conversation because his press conferences tend to be monologues. He doesn't want to be interrupted. He hardly completes a thought. So the reporters are scared or intimidated to ask follow-up questions. So uh, our stories are, are not complete. I want to ask you about journalist safety in the Philippines and the issue of impunity. According to the Committee to Protect Journalists, a New York-based organization, 90% of all cases of journalists who have been murdered in the Philippines since 1992 have gone unsolved. Is that something that is felt in all sectors, this kind of impunity when it comes to cases of murder, not just in the media, or are journalists, when it comes to this kind of thing, in a special category? No, I don't think journalists are in a special category because we have the same case with judges. In the Philippines, a num many judges have already been killed. And of course, now in the war on drugs, it's the poor suspects who are being killed. So it's just that we pay attention to our colleagues who have been killed because, of course, we have this duty to report on what's happening in the Philippines and in corruption in government or uh, what the powerful people do. So we like to give a special regard for our colleagues. But in that sense, we are not any different, as I said, from, from judges and from the poor people who are now victims of drug killings. One final note on terminology. It's been said that the term war on terror masks what it really is, a war on Muslims. And that in reality, the U.S. version of the war on drugs amounts to a war on African Americans. In the Philippines, the overwhelming majority of casualties aren't drug kingpins or gang bosses. They're a long way down the supply chain. And with the death toll approaching 8,000, it's up to journalists to decode the terminology. The Filipino version of the war on drugs looks very much like a war on the poor. We'll see you next time here at The Listening Post.